as we start to dig out our base layers and search for that pair of waterproof socks you swore you bought last year, it's also time for us to consider what bikes will be making waves next year out on the trails. We don't need our crystal ball for this as we're not exactly attempting to predict the future, but more identify where things have evolved or what designs might become popular in 2023. We think all these bikes will be setting the trends for the years ahead and we'll tell you why you need to know about them. As ever with these types of videos, we've not tested the bikes directly one against another because they're just so different. Instead, they've been tested and scored individually. So before we go into each bike individually, here are the seven bikes that will make their mark in 2023. Coming up, we've got the Trek Fuel EXE Midway e-bike, the Hope HB916 Enduro bike, the Nomad from Santa Cruz's Gravity family, Canyon's EWS winning Strive, the Voima e-bike from Finnish brand Pole, UK Steel in the shape of a Bird Forge, and Mondraker's mid-travel race with suspension telemetry included. If you want to see full reviews of these bikes, hunt out the current MBUK issue 413 in the UK, or keep an eye out for our reviews filtering onto bikeradar.com in the coming months. Our first bike is Trex Fuel EXE e-bike, a bike that we believe is a big step forward in electric mountain bike tech. It has a smaller motor, more range and longer battery life. That's the holy trinity for EMTB design. Oh, and it's almost silent too. What's not to like? Rob believes that the Fuel EXE gives an insight into where the future of e-bikes lies. Here he is to tell you more. Trek might not be the first brand to roll out the lighter weight e-bike, but the Fuel EXE may well be the best example of one yet. The brand really took a gamble when partnering with the relatively unheard of company TQ to produce their motor, but it meant they were able to work from the ground up and design the bike exactly as they wanted, rather than build it around a pre-existing drive unit. Thanks to the seriously compact size and lightweight design of the TQ HPR50 motor, Trek didn't need to compromise on geometry either. The motor punts out 50 newton meters of torque with a peak power of 300 watts. So, assuming your mates aren't boosting off into the distance in turbo mode, you can ride alongside full powered e mountain bikes something not all lightweight EMTBs are capable of. Sure, you'll need to dig a little deeper on steeper climbs, but it's more than doable. The 360 watt hour battery offers a decent amount of ride time too. I managed 32.6 kilometers with 1,347 meters of climbing in the middle mode, returning to the car with just 1% of battery life left. And yes, that felt heroic. Power is delivered instantly and very naturally, so there's no weird quirks you need to get accustomed to. Just jump on and ride. As for the geometry, the Fuel EXE feels incredibly confident and stable at speed. Combine this with the well-balanced suspension and relatively low weight, and you get a bike that feels comfortable being chucked about, lofted and launched without giving yourself a hernia in the process. Despite the trail bike tag, the solid feel of the frame, impressive proportions and suspension feel make it feel more capable than the 140mm of rear wheel travel might suggest. I honestly love riding this bike. It does a wonderful job of blending that regular trail bike feel with enough assistance on the climbs to join friends on full powered e-bikes if I want to. Yes, the model you see here is seriously, seriously expensive at £13,250 or $14,000. But it's good to know that Trek offers other versions of the Fuel EXE for a lot less cash, but that use the same frame and drive unit. If you want to know more, check out the Bike Radar article in the link below. High pivot mountain bikes have enjoyed a resurgence in recent years, with big ticket launches from brands including Cannondale, GT, Da Vinci and Norco, all adopting an idler and coming with claims of improved suspension performance. It's safe to say that there have been mixed reviews so far. Hope is the latest brand to adopt the suspension system, but is it more successful than its competition? And if the British brand is going down this route, then will there be an even bigger influx of high pivot designs in the future? Hope's new HB916 Enduro machine is a radical departure from their first HB160 and uses a new suspension layout complete with high main pivot and idler. We've seen more brands jumping on the high pivot bandwagon over the last few years, but not all of them have hit the mark. Hope's HB916, however, does a fine job of delivering a bike more than happy to scalp the edges off the nastiest hits, but still feel seriously capable when being pedaled up the hill. 
They've pushed the geometry figures more than many mainstream brands, with reach figures varying from 450 to 510 millimeters. In the low setting, the head angle hovers around the 63 degree mark, while the seat tube angle is seriously steep at close to 79 degrees. The 160mm of travel is delivered using Hope's high pivot design. It offers enough progression to use either an air or coil sprung shock. Out on the trail, it felt sure-footed and eager to be ridden fast almost straight away. It's nice being able to easily switch to the smaller rear wheel without too much hassle too. The HB916 is, after all, designed to be ridden as either a full 29er or with mixed wheels. Personally, I preferred the mullet setup. The steep seat tube angle really makes seated climbing comfortable and I was more than happy winching my way up super techie inclines with the shock left fully open, allowing it to work away. It's the descents where the HB916 really shines though. Batter it into matted roots or jagged braking bumps and it'll smooth the trail impressively well. But this isn't a bike that leaves you feeling disconnected by flattening every bump into the trail. No, the HB916 still offers enough feedback through the frame to ensure you know exactly what's happening beneath the tyres and there's a decent amount of support and pop built in to ensure the bike retains a dynamic, fun and lively feel. In hectic terrain it feels composed and calm even if you don't, which is a massive plus when picking lines and staying on track. The Olin shock did feel a little over damp for my weight and the Hope carbon bar was too stiff for my liking, but that doesn't detract from what an impressive bike Hope have created here. Though launched last year, the Forge reminds us that the British designed steel hardcore hardtail is here to stay, and the future for this genre of bikes looks good to us at least. Why? Well, as more and more brands pump out longer travel bikes, those looking for a little more connection to the ground, but still wanting to hit the ever-growing network of steep, loose technical trails, now have a raft of hardtails designed specifically for rattling through Nagerie Tech. The Forge stainless uses stainless steel. The rust-resistant material is more impact-resistant, and so those knocks and scrapes that are part and parcel of mountain biking are more likely to be shrugged off. That's why the Bird Forge is here, but how does it perform out on the trail? No frame with zero rear suspension and 2.4 inch rubber at the back is ever going to be smooth, but the classically skinny tubes of the steel frame gives a slight respite from the harshness that stiff carbon or alloy frames can give. Add in a long 1200mm wheelbase and the bike pitches forward and back less over bumps in the ground than a shorter bike would, calming the ride in rough terrain. These two elements combine to allow the Forge to hold good speed off-road, without the bike feeling like it's rattling every filling out of your teeth. In corners, the moderately slack 65.5 degree head angle combines well with the slammed bottom bracket. Your weight is dropped low below the bike's axles, encouraging you to engage the tyre shoulder treads in the dirt to carve a corner. The low BB, medium length stays and long front centre make the Forge sound like it could be a bit of a handful in tighter terrain. But throughout testing, I never found the bike held me back. It's easy to pivot side to side and even the odd cheeky Scandi flick was encouraged. Its biggest nemesis are thick, moderately spaced roots, which steal speed more than closely packed or individual roots you can pull up and over a void. Here and on equally spaced rocks, I felt the XO case tyre on my build was most at risk. Given the speed the forge encourages, I'd want to run an XO plus casing as a minimum, or perhaps chuck an insert in the tyre. Fortunately, Bird are one of the growing number of brands that allow some alteration of the spec at the point of purchase. At the time of recording, an Exo Plus Asagai would be a slightly stronger but slightly slower rolling option. The new RockShox Pikes air spring and damping combine to give great support as your weight is pitched forward. And while the front wheel doesn't look miles ahead of the bar, I never found it feeling nervous as I tipped it into steeper terrain. The Formula Cura brakes on my build are some of my favourites, with a firm but not digital feeling bite and ample power from the dual pistons, so confidence on steep tracks is boosted. On paper, the 75.2 degree seat angle measured at my pedalling height doesn't sound particularly steep, but with the fork sagged it steepens rather than slackening as they tend to on a full suspension rig. A search the climbing position as well as a lack of suspension bob helps the bike climb capably. Another e-bike, this time from Finnish brand Pole. Much like the Hope, the Voima has an interesting take on geometry and design, but that's not why it makes this list. The bike industry isn't known for being the most innovative, so it's great to see a brand trying a fresh approach to building their bikes. Here's Alex to tell you all about how it's made and how it rides. Finnish brand Pole aren't afraid of doing things differently, and the Voima, which is their first e-bike, is no exception. 
It's made from CNC machined billet aluminium. That means they've taken one solid chunk of aluminium and machined the bike's shape out of it. This is done in two parts, and these two parts are then bonded together. The glue that bonds it together is so strong that the brand back the bike up with a massive warranty, and it has also been granted a Category 5 certification, which means that it lives up to downhill bike standards. Its geometry is another factor, but Pole hasn't followed the trends entirely. Yes, the bike is slack and it's long, but it's certainly not low. Pole claims that by making the bike taller in both its stack and bottom bracket heights, it should make it easier to ride on technical, gnarly and steep terrain. For context, this means that there is zero bottom bracket drop, where the bottom bracket lines up with the axles on the horizontal plane. Out on the trail, this means the Voima is an interesting bike to ride. On flat out, gnarly, bumpy trails, it's an absolute beast, where the 190 millimeters of front and rear suspension travel absorb bumps really well. However, get into slightly tighter trails and things become a little slower. That high bottom bracket and high stack both contribute to slow handling. This can make it a bit of a handful in tight and twisty trails. Arguably, Pole's CNC machining construction techniques do mean that they could make changes fairly easily, especially compared to traditional tube and welded bikes. In my opinion, I'd love to see other brands take on such ambitious ways of building their bikes. The Voima is truly a thing of beauty, and while the geometry might not suit everyone, it is certainly groundbreaking. If you're a hard, fast charging rider, you're gonna love the way this thing rides. And there's no denying that its looks and construction technique make it one of a kind. The brand new Canyon Strife CFR has enjoyed a bit of a growth spurt. It's now stretched out and has undergone some radical geometry changes. That geometry is also highly adjustable. These changes are aimed at bringing back the Strive to its thoroughbred enduro racing roots. But was it successful? Luke gives you his thoughts. It was no stretch to say Canyon Strive was a little left behind in terms of geometry for the enduro bike genre. The brand even admitted that with the Strive being the only long travel 29 inch wheel bike, it also had to appeal to trail orientated riders. However, with Canyon introducing its new spectral and torque ranges, the Strive was freed up to go back to its roots and return to a thoroughbred enduro race bike. Don't be fooled by the silhouette looking similar to its predecessor. The Strive CFR is a new beast with a complete frame overhaul. Backed by popular demand from Canyon's factory enduro race team is the bike's shapeshifter. This Fox built piston changes the position of the shock within the frame which alters the geometry and suspension leverage rate that gives this bike two personalities. In my opinion, this is still one of the best uses of on-the-fly adjustment that lets you alter a bike's handling and pedaling characteristics. Let off the brakes and the latest Strive comes alive with its 160mm of rear travel. It has a thirst for speed and shines when the going gets rough. The updated frame tube profiles have increased the frame stiffness, which makes it a direct handling bike. At mellow speeds, this can translate into a bit of harshness. However, the seriously low 36 mm bottom bracket drop and slack 63 degree head tube angle offers plenty of stability, so you rarely need to throttle back on speed. The grippy Maxxis Max Grip tires and snappy 435 mm chainstays mean you can throw the Strive around and it will change direction quickly without fear of the bike trying to get away from you. Click the shapeshifter into pedal mode and the Strive's personality flips. The travel is limited to 140 millimeters, the head tube angle steepens by 1.5 degrees and the bottom bracket is lifted 15 millimeters. This transforms the bike's handling and character. It's a helpful tool for keeping the bike engaging over mellower terrain and improves the climbing ability. The updates to the Canyon Strive have certainly put it at the aggressive end of the enduro bike spectrum where it really is long, low and slack. And why not? It's been built to serve a specific purpose and no longer needs to compromise. It wasn't a step, but a giant leap in the right direction for the Strive. 
On paper, the Santa Cruz Nomad might not be as complex as a Canyon Strive, but the brand's do-it-all heavy hitter has switched to a mixed-wheel setup for 2023. Does this mean we're going to see more mullets than in an 80s nightclub? Are you a mullet fan? Let us know in the comments. Luke has been putting the Nomad through its paces. The long-standing Santa Cruz Nomad retains its place as the Californian brand's most wild bike by its downhill-specific V10. However, this time around, they've increased its versatility by introducing a 29-inch front wheel while also tweaking the geometry and suspension kinematics. The Nomad was always known for maintaining its 650B status. So why change now? And is this the beginning of the end for dedicated 27.5-inch front wheels? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. The Nomad dishes out 170 millimeters of suspension travel front and back and is paired with slack and capable geometry for tackling even the most ferocious descents. Santa Cruz tweaked the suspension kinematics by lowering the anti-squat to better improve bump absorption over square edge hits, albeit with a slight sacrifice in pedaling efficiency. The starting leverage rate was also lowered to better support body weight movements and maintain geometry stability. When hitting the trails, it's clear of the Nomad's intentions. It's a nowhere poor climber and the updated geometry makes for a comfortable seated position. Point this bike downhill and it comes alive. Those grippy tires are brilliant for giving you trust in the bike. This confidence is further boosted by the Nomad's capable suspension that soaks up chunky trails with ease. The Nomad isn't just a one-trick pony. On mellower trails, the coil shock and leverage rate provide plenty of support to push against, allowing you to pump and pop your way down the hill to boost the fun even when the trail is tamer. The 29-inch front wheel helps give the Nomad a little extra speed over bumpy ground, but it hasn't reduced its fun factor in the corners. While there's plenty of stability from the slack 63.5 degree head tube angle, the moderate reach lengths and size specific chainstays give the Nomad an eagerness in the turns and a sharpness to its handling. The new Nomad's increase in versatility has only made a good bike better, and in my opinion, any trade-offs from the new 29-inch front wheel are far outweighed by its benefits. Mondraker's mid-travel trail bike features a svelte 130mm rear end with a burly forked 150mm up front. What makes this full carbon bike stand out though is the onboard telemetry system designed by Mondraker, which they've called MIND. Magnetic field sensors on fork and shock send live data on suspension use to an app helping you see how much travel is used where on the trail, as well as giving hints to shock and fork setup. Ignoring the mind telemetry for now and questions over value for money, the raise impressed me no end during testing. Though the raise's forward geometry with its long front end and short stem may not be classed as radical anymore, it does work exceptionally well. On fast straights, you can just hang on and let the fork and shock deal with the bumps, while confidence on steeper terrain is exceptional. Drop the front wheel into an awkward steep corner where lesser bikes might understeer wildly. The Razor's Maxxis Dissector front tire digs in and pulls you out of trouble. The Vox 36 Performance Fork Springs keeps you propped up while the chassis refuses to buckle. Mondraker's zero suspension linkage doesn't give a completely isolating ride. The mind telemetry is unique, but I feel money could have been better spent elsewhere. That's because, for the money, the performance level suspension, lower end SRAM NX and GX drivetrain, and frankly weak SRAM G2R brakes compromise overall performance and value, much more than the telemetry adds at this level of bike. In my eyes, the data, whilst interesting, needs to be more detailed to be truly useful. For example, it may suggest you need less sag, but doesn't indicate how much less you may need. Telemetry has the potential to be an incredibly useful tool to the dedicated rider looking to eke maximum performance out of their bike. However, it's not a tool that will appeal to every rider out there. If Mondraker could make it an add-on option to their bike while improving the value for money of the stock bike, this would make it more of a winner in my eyes. So there you have our seven trend-setting bikes for 2023. What do you think about them? Let us know in the comments if we've got it right or if you've got it wrong. Are there any bits of technology that we haven't talked about that might make a massive impact on the mountain bike scene in the years to come? As ever, don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and click that little bell icon so you get notified every time we release a new video.